Good morning. So good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome to Middlebrook Heights Community United Church of Christ. I am Pastor Sue Prey, and I want to give a special welcome to visitors or folks who have returned after some time away. Thank you for coming this morning. A beautiful day. I opened the doors to our courtyard, so I hope some of you might enjoy a little time out there before you leave today. It's a beautiful space. For those of you in the sanctuary, if you could remember to fill out the attendance pad at the end of your pews and pass it down. Um, for those of you on Zoom, a um, reminder to put your prayer concerns in chat, and we will get to those later in the service. Hymn Sunday was supposed to be today, and we postponed it um, with, the, with some cautions because of um, the uptick in the COVID numbers. We just figured singing probably wasn't the best thing to be doing. Also, um, a lot of folks aren't coming into in person. There are more folks on Zoom right now. So we wanted to reschedule it at a time when we can have um, greater participation and much more enjoyment. So stay tuned. We're looking at September. Fingers crossed, prayers said, toes crossed, whatever you have to do. Uh, you'll be informed each week in the good news as to the COVID levels as of Thursday morning and the precautions we'll be taking for Sunday worship. We also have signs on the door. And speaking of COVID numbers, out of a preponderance of caution, we are not going to be passing collection plates today, though I probably shouldn't be passing the pew pads down either. Oh, well, didn't think of that. Um, so we're not passing the offering plates today, and we ask that you deposit your offering in the box at the sanctuary doors. We are still collecting holy water. Um, the holy water will be, if you collect it, if you get it on vacation, um, bring it into the sanctuary. We're looking at September 17th um, as the day that we will pour it all in a big bowl for um, the collection for our baptismal font. We've been reading and watching the devastation in eastern Kentucky from the flooding. And we received words from our friend, friends at the Lots Creek community. And while the school is fine, they suffered some serious damage in the dorm and the cabin. And the surrounding area is consumed with rescue. Rows of homes, mostly trailers, are gone completely. And as of this morning, there were 25 reported deaths and still many unaccounted for. Lots Creek is opening their food pantry for all, but because they lost one of their major suppliers, their inventory is rather low. So we are reaching out to everyone right now for some monetary donations, which we will send to Lots Creek and will be used to restock their food pantry in, in this emergency situation as their community continues their rescue and rebuilding processes. So please make your donations out to Middleburg Heights Community United Church of Christ with a notation for Lots Creek, and we will be sure it gets to them. Our Middleburg missionaries have begun their work in Huntsburg, Ohio, cleaning a property. They are, there are still opportunities to participate August 17th and August 31st. Contact Sandy Yule for sign up and any questions. Our Allies for Justice group, our social ministry, continues to reach out to folks for some relational conversations. These meetings have been edifying, engaging, just a wonderful time for sharing. And I hope you will respond when invited to have these conversations. And if you're anxious to get on our schedule, you can contact Russ Smith or myself, and we will be happy to get you scheduled. We'll put you on the schedule. The more, the merrier. Thank you. Our adult faith formation classes will be resuming in September. Wow, the summer's gone fast. And we will open our season with a study of some of the prophets. We will be using a study guide by Walter Brueggemann with some other voices entering the conversation as we go along. There will be some books available for use, right, Anne? We're going to buy a few, weren't we? Okay. And, uh, or you can purchase your own, or you can fi perhaps find one at the local library. But the book is not required. Um, the Bible is required. We will be reading text. And um, you, you will just 
there will be a time of sharing, and as many who have participated in these classes can tell you, our sessions are filled with interesting discussion, diverse opinions, and at times we take on some challenges of our biblical text. I hope you'll join us. It will be Sunday morning in person at 9.15 or on Zoom in an evening yet to be determined <laughs> at, uh, at 7 o'clock. Um, probably Sunday, but we're not sure yet. The Youth Ministry School Supply Collection is here. I saw the bags being laid out there in our lobby. Pick up your bags on the table in the hallway and return them by September 4th. This collection is for church world services and school kits are distributed to children in impoverished schools, in refugee camps, or other difficult settings and provide some of these basic tools needed for learning. I hope you'll consider joining in this important mission opportunity. And now, as we enter our time of worship, futility. In our world today, with so many pressing problems of such huge dimension, it's not uncommon for some to feel that change is just not possible. The writer of Ecclesiastes speaks to the meaninglessness of life, that everything is impermanent and transient. But is it? Can we have an impact on future generations? Luke reminds us that there is meaninglessness when we use wealth and possessions to define us. When we identify with things or social constructs instead of God, life may indeed seem futile. But there is a point to a life with God. There is a point to using our gifts, our possessions, our wealth, and yes, even our privilege to impact systems that prevent others from living a full life. We can indeed impact future generations, and in fact, we have an obligation to do so. Please enter into an attitude of worship as we listen to the prelude. Welcome to the bells. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship.
Come, let us worship. We give thanks to you, O Lord, our God, and we glorify your name forever. For your love is great towards us. You are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Let us worship, let us praise, let us give thanks. Let us pray. Holy love, we worship you as your people. You tether us to you in righteousness and covenant. Reveal your face to us. Let us see you in our midst, in our neighbors and in ourselves. Help us to see truth and live you for your justice. Clothe us in love and compassion and continually fashion us as your people, for you are our God. And we are called to follow and serve. Amen. Please remain standing for the opening hymn.
Please be seated. Spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind on the sea. The Spirit of God moves us to live into this, God's kingdom. The Spirit is ever-present, yet we often disregard the power and influence, and yes, the support of the Holy Spirit. God calls us to the action of love, to use Jesus as our model as we disrupt the systems that dominate and oppress, as we speak up for the vulnerable. We first need to see, we need to be open to hearing, we need to be willing to accept that we can indeed make a difference with God's guidance. Join me in the prayer of transformation and new life. Gracious one, you have knit us together wonderfully. You have promised your abiding presence in our lives and have guided us with love. We turn away from you toward the path that leads to discord, complacency, and cynicism. We judge our neighbor rather than love them, and we fail to even honor ourselves as your beloved creation. We want to care for your creation, but we often find the forces of disruption and destruction much more powerful. Too often, we fall into our familiar practice of serving our own and staying close to home. We ask for your spirit to strengthen us, to give wisdom and courage, and to show us a path toward justice for all. Amen. The God of mercy bends towards God's children with love and hope. The Holy One leads us when we wander onto divergent paths and nourishes our hunger for newness in life. In God, grace abounds freely, abundantly, and extravagantly. God provides, cares, and offers second chances. Amen. The book of Ecclesiastes is part of the wisdom tradition of the Hebrew scriptures. Writings in this book are filled with lament and pessimism, but careful reading shows many tensions and contradictions. The writer of Ecclesiastes speaks to the perpetual meaning, perpetual search for meaning in life and how often he is consumed with futility, that no amount of effort makes a difference and that both the wise and the foolish suffer the same fate, death. This reading is significant for our time, as so many of us find our world consumed with such darkness. There is no path forward. So why try to change things? But the writer eventually challenges himself by offering that God gives wisdom and joy to the one who pleases God. So then isn't that something to live for? an interpretation from the New International Version. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun 
All of them are meaningless, chasing after the wind. I hated all things, for I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave it all they own to another who has not even toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases God, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. God is still speaking. Gospel reading is from Luke. By the 80s, that's the 0080s, when this gospel was written, the world had not yet come to an end, and Luke speaks less about the second coming of Christ and the, end, and the end of the world, and more about the ongoing needs of the church and the world and the religious values of the faithful. Luke criticizes those with wealth who choose to ignore the poor. Luke sees such people as self-serving, self living self-focused lives, much like the writer in Ecclesiastes was suggesting. From Luke 12, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd just said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who has pointed me, a judge or arbiter between you? Then Jesus said to the crowd, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. I will store my surplus grain there. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. God is still speaking. Thank you, Judy, for that dramatic reading of Ecclesiastes. Pray with me. O oh, gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, patience to wait for you. Grant us, O oh God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I've been preaching from the lectionary, and it dawned on me that many of you may not know what I mean when I say that. The lectionary is a pre-selected collection of scriptural readings from the Bible that can be used for worship or study. Each Sunday, there are two Old Testament texts with a corresponding psalm to choose from, as well as New Testament, usually a gospel and epistle. The lectionary runs in a three-year cycle and then repeats. 
So we are right now on year C, if anyone is following. One of the benefits of following the lectionary, because it drives what scripture to feature and lessens the tendency for me to drive what trajectory worship might take. By following the lectionary, I turn the choices and the interpretation over to God. As I follow the lectionary, I often find myself drawn to Old Testament text or Hebrew scriptures as I refer to them. I know there are some traditions that preach almost exclusively from our New Testament, but I find there's such value and richness and relevancy in Hebrew scriptures, and I enjoy spending some time on them. And I hope you have appreciated some of the readings we've been through in the pre preceding weeks. Of course, that's not to diminish our Gospels, and we will get there. That barn story is going to be here. You know, wait a bit, though. Both of our texts today speak to how we live our lives, how we identify with the world, where we find our meaning. And I find these texts particularly timely as our Allies for Justice group is asking you all, how do you want to define our social justice ministry? How do we want to be understood as a community of faith that follows the teachings of Jesus? And where might we put our time and our talents and our resources to make a difference in this world? Where will our church find and make meaning today? The book of Ecclesiastes falls in the category of writings or poetry in our biblical text. And within that genre, it more specifically lands in the area of wisdom literature, along with Proverbs and Job. The author, known by the name of Koheleth, or teacher, is a controversial sort and writes about his observations on the nature of the world and the God of creation. He writes about meaning of existence as if he's on this existential quest. And many find his work a bit cynical as he often lands with conclusions of hopelessness and meaninglessness and futility. But there is a significance to his observations and revelations, because as we live in our current time, don't we sometimes experience these, those moments when we say, what does it matter? Or why bother? Or how can I possibly make a difference? Koheleth has many topics in his text, amassing wealth, understanding the opposing forces in life, the terrors of old age, the nature of folly, and more. But today's text has this theme of futility, humanity's inability to make sense of the world around us, and just throwing his hands in the air and saying, what's the use, and just live life for yourself. And right now, I suspect some of you might be secretly nodding. Yes, it really doesn't make sense. And then add to that the readings that we've had in previous weeks when we learn that some of our problems of injustice have been experienced for centuries. We don't seem to be making progress in this kingdom of God work. Our go-to remedy for evil and sin, punishment, that we think should be so effective doesn't seem to be making a difference. Yet we continue to engage in it, and the private prison industrial complex has incredible profits to show for that. But that's a sermon for another day, coming soon. Koheleth sees death as the only certainty in life. And indeed, all life must eventually succumb to death. Death cuts across all categories, classes, and states of being. He sees a search for meaning in life as pursuit of the wind. And with this conclusion, he resorts to focus, focusing only on his own self-serving pleasures. And Koheleth expands on his reasons for futility because he can't control what succeeding generations will do with what he leaves. And that he feels somewhat annoyed that people might benefit from his labors, having had no investment in them. 
So essentially, he's saying, don't plant a tree. If we follow Kohelet's, Kohelet's logic, why plant a tree when I won't live long enough to enjoy its shade? And why plant a tree because after I'm gone, I can't predict that future generations won't chop it down. And they'll enjoy the shade and had no participation in creating that tree and planting that tree or caring for that tree. So why bother? It's all futile. Pretty depressing stuff, huh? Well, that's in our Bible. It sounds a bit self-focused and self-involved, right? So how did this become part of wisdom tradition in our Bible? Well, to read this a different way, I think this writer, Koheleth, he's intentionally creating tension, right? Don't you feel a bit tense right now? Yeah? He's causing us to challenge his assertions, to argue against his ideas of life being futile. After all, we all benefit from God's creation, and we didn't have any hand in starting this place. Koheleth is putting these thoughts and ideas that so many of us have had from time to time. Admit it, we've all had those moments, the futility of it all. But to see them in print and to hear them read out loud, we're forced to reconcile these thoughts. We're moved to consider how selfish and short-sighted this life would be if all we were concerned about was our own time until we die. We see some of these folks, right? Those who seem to be engaged only in what pleases them in this life with no concern for others or the future of the community, the world, or God's creation. The climate change deniers who are unconcerned about their impact on the environment. They live only for, they live only in the now. And those folks who understand their faith as only a ticket to heaven and with that solid in their sight, they see no reason to be involved as caretakers of this world. They only focus on the next. Koheleth would agree with them because historically, efforts to save the environment have not been embraced by subsequent generations, and efforts to change our systems of justice have not resulted in less crime, less evil, and efforts to care for humanity have not resulted and less suffering. So why bother now? Koheleth's observations are based on real life experiences and those we understand all too well today. But how do we push back on this? Well, first, I believe Koheleth is inviting us, in fact, expecting us to push back. He wants us to hear how godless those words sound. In fact, he sums it up in the last verse Judy read. He writes of finding no enjoyment in his labors, but at the end he acknowledges that only with God can we truly find enjoyment, and I will add, can truly find meaning in life. So a life without God is indeed futile. A life when you are not concerned about the future of the planet or future generations or even how your might, life might intersect with someone else's, how you might influence somebody. That's what happens when you don't involve God in your life. For with God comes hope, a sense of purpose, a direction, a place to use our gifts. Goheleth gives us a choice, a life that has some enjoyment and meaning, which is life with God, or a life of futility, which is pursuing the wind. Jesus is a bit more direct about how we should be living our lives. We know that Luke has several stories about Jesus challenging wealth, wealthy people, rich people. In this story, however, it's not the wealth of the rich man that was bad, but what he did what he did with it, what he did with his wealth and possessions is what's called into question. So this man had a good year and a bountiful crop. Nothing wrong with that so far, right? 
But instead of sharing his surplus, he built a bigger barn. Good that he had resources to plant and harvest, and good that the soil and climate were favorable and produced abundantly, but to use his resources to create more storage space simply for the purpose of hoarding, mine, all mine, of sitting on his abundance. That's what Jesus was unhappy with. We are not on this earth or in this life to live only for ourselves. We are not here to define ourselves by our acquisitions, how much we have, how much we can store up. We're here to use our resources and our gifts for improving God's kingdom. We are here to prove Koheleth wrong, that we can indeed make a difference, that we can count on subsequent generations to learn from our example and continue carrying the torch and build on what we start we, in fact, owe it to future generations to care for their creation and humanity so the world they inherit may be just a little bit better than this one. The gospel story opened with a couple of young men wanting Jesus to settle a dispute about their inheritance. And as far as Jesus was concerned, that should not even have been the question. The question is more about why was there such a big pot for them to inherit? Or why aren't they researching how they might use that inherit, inheritance to care for God's kingdom? How might we use our own resources to improve some system? Not for ourselves, but for the good of some piece of God's creation, some slice of humanity, some system of injustice. Koheleth might sound like a snarky old codger, but in the end, I want to believe that he was setting us up as readers to get indignant and to challenge his assertions. And in that challenge, we have to look at ourselves and how we engage with life. Where do we find our meaning and how are we influencing future generations to continue this work? How are we sharing our resources beyond our own personal enjoyment or beyond this church building. He wants us to get energized, to react, and to engage with life. He wants us to believe that our efforts today can and will make a difference in the future. But we need to be walking with God, and we need to be willing to invest in that future with the resources of today. Many have said, but the youth of today aren't coming to church. How can we possibly have an impact? And I say, if we're doing God's work, the work in which future generations find meaning, we just might be that church that invites others with a similar understanding of faith. Do we want to be defined by how much we have stored up? How much we have saved? I have a sign in my office at home. It reads, Life is not a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, Wow, what a ride. How do you want to live until you die? How do you want to impact future generations? Do you want to be defined by your possessions or your wealth? By the amount of inheritance you leave? Or would you rather be the one who did God's work and arrives sliding in broadside, leaving a legacy of a life that had meaning and enjoyment? Because it was a life with God. It's your choice. And let all the people say, Amen.
Thank you, Bells. Always a joy to have you here. And I hope you will be able to come back when we have our hymn Sunday. Cross our fingers, hopefully in September. Time to share any joys or concern, prayer concerns you might want to share with the congregation. Are there any here in the sanctuary? Athena. Oof. Thank you. For our, our Zoom friends, Athena shared that a very close friend of theirs had a stroke yesterday. It was yesterday? And is in the hospital going through some testing. So keep her, her, it was a female? Yeah. Him, keep him. What was the name? Clint. Clint. Keep Clint in our prayers. Also, celebration of Henry's fourth birthday, um, recognizing that he had some. Um, struggles early on but he's happy and healthy as we see him with filled with joy all the time any others here in the sanctuary jeff Jeff offers, uh, wants us to keep the Lufer family, some relatives, in prayer as their father died, father and husband died, and we will keep them. Grief is a journey. Any others? Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Kathy. Kathy Blessinger shares that her and Alan celebrate 57 years next weekend. Blessings, blessings. Any others? Such joy. Nikki. And her name? Krista, a friend of Nikki's, Krista, had to have a kidney removed yesterday and is in recovery now and keep her in prayers for this long journey ahead. Any others in the sanctuary? On Zoom? Uh, from Flo, um, says, Les and I are asking for prayers for our dear friends in Texas the Han family, who have all tested positive for COVID, and especially for Gary, who's been hospitalized for testing due to cardiac irregularities. I have a few more to share. Um, from last week, apologies to Joe and Tom Casterline, who I missed in last week's um, list. They were in one list and not the one I was reading off of. They are recovering from COVID and had to cut their vacation short and come home. They returned from their trip early. They were fortunate to get the COVID antiviral drug, and they report that their symptoms are subsiding and they're waiting out their time in quarantine. When I spoke with them this past week, they were both out in the car for a car ride, maintaining quarantine in, in their car. We know how Tom and Joe really don't like sitting still. I'm sorry for your shortened vacation. And with that, we also want to lift up everyone who is experiencing symptoms of COVID with this new um, variant. Um, we are understanding it's just so, so, so contagious. Um, so we all might be getting it soon. Who knows? Keep in prayer the people of Eastern Kentucky, we mentioned earlier, who are dealing with the devastation of the flooding 
and including our friends at Lots Creek. We want to pray for Andrea Luca's nephew, Dallas Schlatter, and the family. He had surgery on his shoulder this past week after a motorcycle accident. And Char Finley offers to ask for prayers for her niece, Lisa Boozer. Uh, she was taken to the hospital this past week with a diagnosis of fibromuscular dysplasia of the carotid artery. Not quite sure what that is, but it sounds, anything with the carotid artery sounds very serious. We ask for prayers for our entire worship ministry team who will be meeting this week for a three-day retreat to do some planning and sharing and coordinating for our worship experiences for the fall and longer. It takes a village to create our time of worship and planning ahead is needed to allow time for the God-inspired work that is so necessary as part of this process. We continue prayers for the family and friends of Carl Kaiser, a former member of this congregation who d died July 21st at the age of 85. A memorial service for family and friends will be held later in the summer or early fall. Joyce Sigler had uh, a mastectomy on Wednesday. Um, the procedure went well. She is home recovering, continued prayers for her healing. Continued prayers for families that have experienced loss, the family of Marilyn McCullough, um, Deb Thompson's family. We also continue praying for Mars Patterson as he begins with a new surgeon for his continued journey of reconstruction. And we have continue on our prayer list, Gus Freilich, John Nagemba, Dan Adams, Bill Simpson, Jan and Dale Henninger, Carol and Lloyd Dorner, and continued prayers for those who have experienced loss, family and friends of Carl Lawrence, the Blessingers, Ken Lentz, the Van Zanti family, and Bob and Connie Lewis. We pray for all families and caregivers dealing with debilitating and progressive diseases. May the suffering be lightened by God's grace and mercy, and may your journey be supported by others who have also traveled this road. And now as we join our hearts and our minds in this time of community prayer, please center yourself that you experience God in some moments of quiet and stillness. Open yourself to listening as the Spirit unites us and fills us and be in a time of stillness. Holy One, we come together this day to be united as a community and to experience you, your spirit, your message, and your love. We offer our thanks for this day, for our ability to be present with you and for others. We only hope that our lives may serve as an invitation for others to know you and your grace and your mercy. Help us to be a people who are able to trust in you and your goodness. Help us to be a people who live by faith and offer ourselves and our resources to create a better world for those who come after us. And help us to be a church, a community of faith that is living the model you gave us in Jesus, a model of servanthood and compassion and selflessness and love. And in that way of being in the world, help us to stand for something, something that makes a difference, something that offers others to want to be part of it. As our world at times seems overwhelming, and at times we might wonder about the futility of it all, fill us with your hope. Help us to dream and imagine and plan for this new creation this new way of being church, a new and different way to be a people of God. 
We lift in prayer those who are fleeing devastation from war or violence or food insecurity. We pray that they find new life in a new space that is welcoming and offers hope. And we lift in prayer those defending their homes and their communities from others who are exerting power to take and destroy. We pray for a better world and that we might be your servants to offer hope and new life and care for all of God's kingdom. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who said, pray this way. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The promise of life abundantly invites us to trust God's provision and abundance of resources for all. We share our gifts from the abundance given to us. Let us pray. Loving God, we may demonstrate our love through these gifts, bless them and magnify them so that all creation will benefit from your abundance and gift of life and love. Amen. Now please stand and join in our closing hymn, number 522, I Love to Tell the Story. <laughs> 